Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So just want to start recording as well. So we go. So before we go to the talk, um, we uh, we are. Uh, Santa Clara Valley chapter, these are the offices. Um, George is the vice chair, she is secretary, treasurer, we have a new treasurer timing. Uh, then we have some of the industrial liaisons from, um, for example, from Equal One Labs, we have Imran. Is, then we have Jonathan, David from uh, Qualcomm, Robert from Renaissance, and Dr. YK Chen from Alibaba. We also have the CAS uh, face, uh, Santa Clara Valley Facebook page. Uh, we host, we actually post the new events coming up. So if you subscribe to it, you'll get notifications. As well as we have our website. Um, you can bookmark this website. We post all our events here. Then the lectures posted on IEEE TV, actually posting up, I have some of those last few lectures which I want to post on YouTube. So I apologize for not putting them, uh, but I'll hopefully I'll put them very soon. And then I want to talk about some future CAS events coming up. We have in a few days, uh, the our uh, uh, ISCAS uh, that is completely almost virtual. So then we have the um, flagship event of the United States or maybe region six as the Midwest Symposium Second Systems. That's also in sometime in August. And then we have two important, uh, two very interesting lectures coming up. One is from the uh, Asim Gupta Slack, uh, Stanford University. He's gonna talk about the designing digital modules for high-speed readout in graduating TPC detectors. Uh, this is gonna be on May 27, 2021. Um, please, I hope to see all of you there. And then we have another distinguished lecture program coming up. That's the next month. Um, and uh, that is from Dr. Professor Trakovic from Simon Fraser University, Canada. She's gonna talk about data mining and machine learning for analysis of network traffic. So with that, um, we go to our lecture. Let me just introduce our um, speaker So Dr. Uh, uh, Shri Navneet Ishwaran, a senior member of IEEE, which he received his bachelor's, master's degrees in electrical engineering and uh, doctor degree from University of Erlangen, Nuremberg in 2017. He worked at SPIC Electronics, ST Microelectronics, Philips Semiconductors, between 1998 and 2006. From 2006, he's with Texas Instruments where he was a design lead for airbag square driver ICs. He has also designed high voltage and 40 and 40 volt tolerant circuits for automotive ICs. He is an IET fellow since February 2021 and is a TI senior member technical staff. He has 20 plus guaranteed patents and 15 publications. He has offered tutorials on automotive design at IEEE conferences. So that I thank you, Rodeshwaran, for accepting our invitation. And I think you may start sharing your screen. Thank you, Amit. So let me start, start my. So it looks like you need to unshare so that I can I start to share. Stop share, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's your turn. Yeah, thank you. Also, just a reminder, we will be taking questionnaire at the end. So uh, if you have questions, please feel free to write it down and we'll take it at the end. Yeah, okay. are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay, thanks. So let me try to go into presentation mode. Yeah, thanks, Amit, for, for introducing me. So the topic today is about fault tolerant smart power drivers with biasing schemes and diagnostic for smart automotive systems. 
So I'm at TI Dallas, as Amit mentioned. So well, I start the presentation by thanking TI, uh, the IDLP chairs, Dr. Alito and Chakravarti, then Amit for hosting me today, and Ms. Britian for the another, helping through this conference uh, organizing, and my PhD thesis supervisor, Dr. Weigel from Germany. So the outline of the presentation will focus on the motivation and automotive SBCs and the challenges. So the SBC stands for system basis chip. And the fault tolerant refers to the hardware shots to ground and shots to battery on the pin side. That is the fault we are talking about and how we will try to protect the circuit from those kind of faults. So that is about pin and design failure mode effect analysis. I'll go into that. Then I will introduce from a designer's perspective, a little bit about the power transistors, the drivers and their supplies. After going to, through those, we'll go into some thermal simulations that are needed for these kind of designs and gate discharge circuits for some unpowered state requirement in the automotive environment. So it's very unique to some of the automotive applications. And all automotive ICs are uh, multiple supply voltage designs. So we need to take care of a few biasing schemes to avoid some uh, inadvertent turn on of some circuits, diagnostics, and then I will uh, provide the summary and conclusions. Okay. So today the electronic content in cars is steadily increasing. And the main reason for that is basically the electronic controls, which is the power semiconductors are completely replacing the hydraulics. And there are many reasons related to safety, reliability, and connectivity. And the standard trend, I mean, the trend today is basically system basis chips. So we have low end system basis chip all the way to high end system basis chips in which the key circuits are the gate drivers and the power fits. So we have a gate driver circuit that drives that gate of the power fit. And what, what all ways we can configure them is what we are going to see. And basically the technology that we use today is, uh, you know, is BCD or by, by CMOS, which is which is what is needed to do these kind of designs. And the main thing is uh, there's alternatively some suppliers call it as BCD technology if they use uh, LDMOS transistors. And of course, in some, in some technologies, instead of offering LDMOS, they use drain extended NMOS transistors for high voltage applications as well. Then it becomes a pure by CMOS technology. So a yeah, system basis chip integrates several circuits, you know, like LED drivers, DC DC converters, solenoid drivers, et cetera, transceivers in a single chip. And the applications of these system basis chip are airbag squib drivers. The squib is the pyro material that deploys the airbag during a crash. Then the braking is through valve drivers, which are nothing but the large inductors. Then you have power steering ICs and motor drivers. So the key features that uh, these ICs uh, have to address are basically a requirement is that they have to withstand 40 volt to 60 volt pin, you know, tolerance on these pins. While there can be applications, there are circuits with five volts as well, but some of the pins, as you will see, they have they are rated to 40 volt to 60 volt in these automotive ICs. And some pins have to take about, withstand about minus 18 volt because of the inductive uh, kickback and also some ground shifts. So this is the requirement in the automotive ICs. Okay. So two decades ago, you know, when the ICs, I mean, were made for automotive, pretty much every function had its own IC. So for example, if you have a power supply unit, it had all the DC-DC converters, LDOs and so on. So that will be a separate IC. And then the gate drivers for, for airbag, for example, was a separate IC. And they had multiple airbags, so they have multiple ICs. So then they had LED drivers, the CAN and LIN communication through an IC for the, you know, basically for moving your doors or moving the windows or, you know, everything is, sent through a local interconnect bus or the can the controller area network bus and now there are also the peripheral sensor satellite interface for acceleration sensors and so on so everything was a unique ic and pretty much what happened is even the pcb size was too large and eventually uh, these in on the last decade there has been a strong integration going on in for automotive devices so we are talking about you know this is this could be like a 3 millimeter square chip and the moment you integrate a do a system basis chip, it could range anywhere between 35 square mm all the way up to 70 square mm based on how much you integrate. So, and the advantages are very clear. So your IC, your PCB size becomes very small, right? 
and then you are lowering your cost. So the bill of materials significantly goes, goes down. You can integrate more functions. You know, it's all not looking nice, but there is also a disadvantage with that, which is basically the power dissipation. Then at one point you become pad limited. So the package, you know, there are restrictions. You need to innovate more on the packaging side as well. The moment all the individual modules, you know, get integrated onto a single chip, two independent modules become dependent on each other, which is called the cross link. And this is one is the negative voltage, the parasitics that influence this cross link. The second thing is basically the EMI, which we are also going to see because of the heavy switching supplies. So it also takes more time to validate it because you have to check individual functionality of each module and also you have to check for this cross link. So it really takes some time to release these devices to market. And the larger the die, what happens is it's also while manufacturing, there could be defect densities that could increase. You know, a smaller die, statistics are shown that the defect density is smaller. A larger die, the defect density increases. So in automotive, it is all zero DPPM. We don't want any defects on from the field to come back uh, to the supplier. So that goal is pretty much challenged. Okay, right. So from a designer's perspective, what kind of challenges we have? So high power dissipation is something which we cannot avoid because we are integrating very large power feds, pushing amps of current into those devices. So if it is a DC, we have to make sure that the package, uh, the die temperature uh, is within 175 degrees, you know, so that the package and the solderability, everything is still intact. When there are some transient conditions, like you will see in some airbag deployment scenarios, which is uh, power dissipation, a really a large power dissipation, about three milliseconds. We could push the temperature up to 450 degrees. It's again based on the technology, as we will see. And as I told you, it's a multiple supply voltage design. So these ICs have to be really robust to power supply faults. So meaning if there's a multiple supply domain, you have high voltage, low voltage, medium voltage all those supplies need not be available to the device at the same time. So in those scenarios, certain inactive deactivation or inward, inadvertent activation of the FET can occur, as you will see why it is happening, and we have to prevent it. And in any automotive environment while designing, we have to consider some inductance. The minimum could be one micro Henry, and the maximum what we have seen is several milli Henrys. If it is a motor, it's a, uh, it's even more. So here in solenoids, what I'm going to talk about is about the three milli Henry, three milli Henry inductance for some solenoid drivers for pedestrian protection. So especially when you have those gate drivers to drive these inductors, the requirement from our customers is to avoid external short key diodes for freewheeling. Because if you have 15 to 20 gate drivers integrated on a single chip, you don't want to have 15 or 20 short key diodes on the board externally to cost then PCB area as well. So all this freewheeling current has to come from the driver somehow. So we will see some techniques that are uh, possible to do that. Then critical thing is basically the input and output pins, especially the output pins when they go outside the control box, right? So which is uh, through a cable. So there is always short to ground or short to battery that is possible on that particular pin. So it can be very fast, it can be a very, very slow shot. The DI by DT or the DV by DT can be very small. So the designs have to handle both those kind of faults, okay? And every automotive IC needs diagnostics because it needs to provide the information to the driver or passenger in advance if there is a fault. And at the same time, we don't want any false flags to alarm the driver or passenger. So the diagnostic has two goals. So we'll see that as well. Okay. Okay, with this, let me dive into the pin and design FME. Uh, automotive ICs, you know, people, you know, just don't take the IP or a schematic and start to design. But before that, there is always a first step that has to happen in the, from a device pin out standpoint. So that is called the pin and pin failure mode effect analysis. And then you go into the design failure mode effect analysis. Let's see what it means to us in detail. For designers, you know, once a pinout is proposed, so I'm giving an example by choosing two pins. I'm choosing a LDO output, so VCC5 and the neighboring pin. 
So any pin, you have to do a fault analysis. You know, if it, what 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 will happen? What is the impact to the IC as well as to the system when there is when there are a few conditions? A pin open, a short to ground, short to battery, and short to the neighboring pin. So all these combinations have to be analyzed, and the risk has to be documented. If there is too much risk, then how we are going to mitigate is what is going to drive the architecture of the design or the IC. So for example, if you short the regulator output to ground, then there is going to be too much current flowing into the pin or flowing out of the pin. So your battery could be drained. There's a lot of power dissipation. So how do we detect it? How do we mitigate it? That's where all designs start, okay? So for example, if I consider a very simple LDO, it's on the right side, it's a, it's a NMOS based LDO, right? So the VDD or the VCC five pin, when you short this to ground, so typically a lot of current flows. So the first mitigation is basically, you know, you have a current limit, which is a very, very standard circuit. You sense the current through the FET, then you have another control loop that's going to limit the current and protect the device in those kind of extreme short circuit scenarios. So for example, if the current limitation is 300 milliamps, right? So a short circuit ground condition prevails for 100 milliseconds. From a battery volt, battery of 14 volt, that is still a lot of power. Some cases consider ask us to consider the battery to about even double, so it's like a double battery condition. While design, designing the circuit, we have to even assume those extreme cases. So 28 volts, for example, that is still a lot of power that is dissipated across the field. Okay. So, okay, 100 milliseconds. So now, how to mitigate it? It's still a lot of power, right? So can we do a overcurrent detector and then protect it? Yes. So let's say for this problem related to item one, so let's put a overcurrent detection as well. So there is current limit. On top of that, you add a comparator that detects this particular fault and then gives you protection. So if the current, okay, is going above 300 milliamps, you know, or like it's, it's a 300 milliamps. So it's a, let's say you put a comparator at 270 milliamp threshold and then say that, okay, oh, if it exceeds 270 milliamp for one millisecond, let's turn off the LDO right away, okay? So we make sure that the FET is able to survive those particular, uh, you know, is able to withstand the junction temperature rise during that one millisecond period, and then make sure it turns off. And then comes another failure. So that is design FMEA. So you're trying to protect the circuit from a short to ground. And then, then we are thinking about what if that current limit is too long, okay? So that is the one of the potential failures in the design or like in the system. So now the design has to still mitigate it. So now you go and add a overcurrent detector to mitigate that particular condition. Okay, then, then comes the second condition, okay? So what if that threshold is not 270, but 250 million? So you're having a short to ground, but somehow the impedance is such that you are not able to go beyond 250 milliamps. So that means your comparator will not trigger because you're not, you're below the threshold. So then comes another backup. So you need to put another backup and that is basically the thermal protection. So this is how, for example, the architecture in automotive IZs uh, are set. So first you put current limit, then you take, you analyze the risk, then mitigate the risk and so on. Of course, you can keep on doing that, but we typically stop with two, two mitigation points, we have over current detector and thermal shutdown, which is more than sufficient to protect the IC against a very harsh environment. So for short to battery, I mean, if, let's say this, the battery is somewhat lower, but then you externally, there is some other way that this voltage can go higher than this. So then you're going to forward bias this diode. So what we typically do in the design is make, uh, put a diode in the other direction to completely block the current from going from VDD back into some of the VBAT uh, capacitors. So this is a very simple mitigation as well that we try to do. So this is how the design start. So at the end of the day, if you see every automotive chip, so it has a gate driver and then a current limit. So a current sensing circuit in order to, in order to protect, in order to provide the load current information as well as protect the device from such harsh conditions. Okay. So let, with this, let's go and look a little bit more into those power transistors. So there are two technologies, which is BCD or the BICMOS. So most of the semiconductor suppliers have BCD because the LDMOS is really the one that is preferred to have large voltage uh, IC, you know, the large power fits 
that can dissipate that power at the very small um, area when, when compared to the rest of the transistors, like brain extended and MOS. But at the same time, the LDMOS transistors have a higher VT, which is about 1.2 volt. So the drain extended transistors do offer a slightly lower VT, about 0.7 to 0.8. So it's a trade-off. In some suppliers, integrate uh, provide both the components so that designers can choose what they want. So we have requirements from 7 ohm RDS on, 500 milli ohm RDS on, and some applications are going down to 30 milli ohms these days. It still can be such large pets can be integrated. And future trends obviously are also going towards GAN because of the power density. And uh, yeah, we will not talk about this here, but that's that's the trend we are also seeing uh, a shift, you know, from LDMOS to to GAN technology as well. Some some applications have started to use GAN. Okay, so when you, when we look into the transistors, you know, this is slightly different from what uh, the regular CMOS uses, right? So. In regular CMOS, what we have, most of the low voltage technologies offer you very symmetrical transistors. So the drain and source resistance is pretty similar. With the, when the bulk is shorted to ground, I mean, so uh, or, or you could uh, connect it back to the substrate, back to the source, I'm sorry. So the, of course, we have to make sure that the VTH is not significantly increasing due to this. In case there is a, option to reduce the VT, obviously are going to tie back the bulk and source together in the NMOS transistor. But what is important is in these kind of technologies, the asymmetrical transistors are really tough for high voltage conditions. So for example, you cannot have, other, there's, to my knowledge, NXP was offering it way back, but nobody else is doing that today. So you don't have a gate to source that is 20 volt rated and a drain to source 20 volt rated. So when you want a 60 volt transistor, nobody is making a gate to source that is 60 volt and drain to source that is 60 volt. This is really, really expensive because you need different kind of oxides for the same, uh, in the same device. And so people have shifted to asymmetrical transistors. So where the gate to source rating in the state of the art technologies is about 5.5 volt. And then there's a LDD structure on the drain to keep extending the rating of the transistor. So a yeah, 20 volt, has its own LDD structures and the 30 volt, I mean, the, the spacings are increased and 40 volt is much more spacing and so on. So that is how the, uh, the high voltage transistors are fabricated these days, but with the gate to source, there is a single oxide which is 5.5 volt. So in, in most of the technologies that I know of today, so there is a low voltage transistors for digital, the gate oxide is about, uh, 1.5 to 1.8 volt in the state of the art. There are 3.3 volt as well. And in the uh, for the analog thick oxide transistors, that oxide can withstand about 5.5 volt. In older technologies, it was about 12 volt. But they you get you need to protect more the gate to source junction, and that is where the design challenge for the designers. You know that is the design challenge uh, that the designers have to face. But the drain side drain to source rating is simply by varying the LDD option. The lower drain, dope drain option gives you various variants. Okay, right. Let, let's look a little bit more from a designer's perspective on the cross section of the LD mass. It's not a true cross section with the rounded gate and so on, but for the designers, what they need to know in the LD mass tr transistors is basically you have a body diode that is built within the LD mass. I mean, if you use it as a diode, meaning with the gate to source shorted in the forward direction, there is a parasitic PNP that we need to consider that there is some leakage which is going into the substrate. So here is basically how the designer's perspective looks. So here you have the substrate, there is a buried layer that is n-type diffused. Then you have a special field P well in which the source is isolated from the substrate. So then you get the potential PNP, you know, there is a junction diode, PN junction that will be forward biased if you operate it as a diode. And there is a vertical PNP that where the current goes into the substrate. Similarly, if you use a drain extended NMOS, you know, where both the drain and source can be isolated, there is a common special P well under which uh, there is a buried layer, and then the typical substrate comes. So the there is a potential NPN and PNP action that can happen in these transistors. So the goal for the designers is to really make sure that when you are operating in MOS mode. The, these buried layers and the P-wells are biased in such a way that you don't have any parasitic current through this 
NPN and PNP transistors. That's the main goal for the designers in order to make sure that such conductions are not happening. Otherwise, the whole functionality gets changed because the current never goes from the drain to source, but from drain to the substrate. So this is this has to be completely avoided. Okay, and for the gate to source protection, the technology offers very good Zener diodes. That is, the NPN transistors can be connected in a CB collector base shorted configuration or a collector emitter shorted configuration to achieve the desired gate to source protection. All you can do is simply throw a Zener diode that protects the gate to source. Without that, it's really tough to put additional clamps because you can always find a condition where it will fail. But if you find a Zener clamp, just throw it in and that's going to protect your transistors from the gate source breakdown. Okay, right. So how are these power stages used? So you could have an NMOS or LDMOS transistor connected this way to the load. So this is the output with the load reference to the ground. And this is basically the high side of the buck configuration. You have a low side driver as well, which is driving an inductive load. This is nothing but a boost type configuration. So how do you drive the gate in an NMOS? So you could have to integrate a boost converter or a charge pump or a bootstrap based on your application, and then make sure that the battery voltage is right available right at the source. So all we need is a very minimal RDS on so that the power dissipation is less in this device. And then most of the power gets dissipated across the load. So that is why all, if you see all standard gate drivers, they have a RDS on specification, a slew rate specification to for EMI, I'll come to that. Then the current limit is needed because the outputs can get shorted to ground or battery. Then in smart power drivers, the customers really expect us to provide the nature of the load. So if this is an open load or a shorted load, they also want to see that in advance before either you during turn on, you turn on and then detect it very quickly or in this driver can be in the off state, then you have additional circuitry to detect the nature of the load at the output. And as these ICs are powered by multiple supplies, we have to make sure that there are no floating nodes that can inadvertently turn on these specs. That's very, very important. And you will see why it is important in the coming slides. And there are some special cases where people don't like these additional circuitry. Let's say you have a gate driver with only, uh, was only one fed, you know, one driver that you need. You don't need to build an additional charge pump or put a bootstrap, uh, you know, where you have to create another pin for those things. Then people simply use a PMOS based topology where, you know, you can also bring the source uh, voltage exactly onto the drain. So only thing is the size of the PMOS is three times bigger than the NMOS. So it's a trade-off based on the application. Okay. So here is some examples, right? It's all a gate driver and a power fit based on what you configure, how you configure the load and the control loop. This becomes, it's a typical buck converter, the asynchronous buck with charge pump. Here you have a synchronous buck with charge pump. Here is a bootstrapped version and here is a PMOS version. So as I told you, you know, some safety devices like airbag don't like to use, uh, you know, the NMOS based buck converters or a boot with bootstrap. And the reason for that is when they have to have some bootstrapping, the, you have to put a diagnostic for it, for that gap. And this people don't like it. And there were some bad experiences on the field. And uh, most of the customers that I know of are in demand uh, a PMOS based buck converter for uh, airbag applications. Okay, right. So summary, whenever you integrate gate drivers, there are two options, go with the LDMOS or a PMOS based. So LDMOS based, it's like a charge pump you need or a bootstrapping you need. For PMOS, you could simply drive this out of the battery right away. So based on the application, so we choose, the, the choice is depending really on the application and system concept. And what we see is basically all the automotive SBCs use a mix of both PMOS and LDMOS gate drivers. So why PMOS? Because some drivers, they want to work in standby mode where the charge pump could be disabled or the boost, boost converter could be disabled. So they use PMOS and uh, you know when, when you go into the real high current mode, they use the LDMOS. So pretty much you see a mix of both kind of drivers integrated on, uh, on SBCs these days, okay? So at the end of the day, no matter what you choose, what type of topology you choose. So the gate driver or the power fit is not allowed to turn on if the control signal is zero because all have a digital control. So there is an enable signal coming to your driver 
which is also controlling your power fit. When that signal is zero, no matter what state we are, we are not allowed to turn on the gate driver. And similarly, whenever all the supplies are available and the control signal is on, except for some of the short circuit conditions that we talked about, the gate driver or the power fit cannot turn off inadvertently. So comparator outputs and that means what? So the all are so you get a low voltage digital signal and then you convert it into a high voltage analog to control these gate drivers. So under all circumstances, those outputs have to really work in the expected way. So that is the biggest challenge. So we, we will see that as well. Why this cross couple level shifters can completely mess up the circuit. Okay, and the trend is also slightly changing in. Uh, or it's demand getting more and more demanding for scalable designs. So for example, this is a PMOS based high side driver. So the current is basically sensed and then we detect the open load and short circuit uh, threshold. So if there is a shorted load, we flag it. If there is an open load, we also flag it. So this is basically the slow rate control for emission and basically a current limit circuitry. And all this you know, are going to come and control your gate of the FET. Right. So, for example, if you take a dry driver, which is a which is a FET with six ohms, so the MP0, if it is six ohms, and then it supports max load of 100 milliamp, the sensed voltage. So, what we do is the sensed voltage should be greater than the noise or the offset of this amplifier. So, typically, we sense about six millivolt to 12 millivolt signal, right? And when you change the driver to a one ohm, all we do is completely scale the design. So that means if the RD is on scales by a factor of six, so you, you increase the uh, fight size by a factor of six, cutting down its resistance by one to one ohm, all the current mirror ratios get scaled accordingly in such a way that the, all the parameters are going in the same direction. So for example, the open load, if it is two milliamp for a six ohm you know, driver that supports up to 100 milliamp, when you get to a 600 milliamp driver, that 12 milliamp load is nothing like noise, it's basically some leakage for a 600 milliamp driver. So you're, you're allowed to control, say that even less than 12 milliamps is considered to be like an open, open load condition. And for the short circuit condition, yeah, 180 milliamp gets to about like 1.0 amp or like six times, yeah, which is, and the current limitation with this, if it is 200 milliamp for a six ohm driver, so you do that at 1.2 amp, you know? So that's how the trend is moving, it's more, moving towards a scalable circuitry. Okay, this is a PMOS based high side driver. This is a, an LDMOS based configurable driver. So this could be used as a high side driver or a low side driver, but everything can be implemented in a scalable fashion just with current mirrors. So slew rate, you need a capacitor and a current source. And all for all the comparators, we do current sensing through, you know, basically current mirror type circuitry and then you decide the topology. You know, basically all your comparators will be current based. You don't need voltage comparator, simply that you sense the current and keep comparing it. The architecture is pretty sim simple and straightforward and it's robust. So you don't, the chances of getting some faults there is very, very rare if the, if the topology is implemented in the right way. So what is the advantage? Of course, it gives you a much more scalable design because you don't need to reinvent the IP for every load condition. All you do is just, scale the design and then make sure in your simulations the thresholds are coming out in the right direction and current limit is also an expected value. And of course, when you move from one technology to the other, this is simply portable right away. So that's how we are trying to implement everything as a ratio of current mirrors. That is also the trend that we are seeing these days from customers. Okay, right. So let's look a little bit more into the power management side of these gate drivers. So you have a battery in the car, which is about 12 volt. Then most of the ASICs operate at 14 volts. Some have integrated charge pumps, some have inter external boost converters. So, but idea is there is always a demand to drive the gate higher than the battery. So there could be a boost converter, which is classified in the high voltage domain. But nowadays there are applications that are running at 200 volt or 300 volt. So this becomes medium voltage, but still for most of the applications, the 40 volt to 60 volt is basically the tolerance of the spin. The boost converter could be at 22 volts or 33 volts based on the application. So from the boost converter output, we have a buck converter which generates about five to six volts. That is again, uh, used for the low voltage circuitry uh, like the analog um, band gaps 
or some sensors externally also connected to these kind of outputs. Then there is a linear 3.3 volt or a 1.5 volt uh, regulator for the uh, digital core and to supply the IO buffers. And the drain supply, which is basically about 12 to 33 volt. And this is the topology for a squib or a solenoid driver, you know, where the load is connected between the high side and the low side driver. I chose this because I, you could see a topology which has to, where the load is connected between both the drivers. So, so here is typically, you know, the, the drain side, and then you have the gate driver, which is higher than the drain voltage. So you could easily uh, drive the gates, you know, towards a 500 milliohm or 300 milliohm RDS on. And the low side driver, typically the gate is at five volt, but then for a additional current limiting, we use the high voltage to sense the current and limit it. So this is a topology which is very common in automotive applications. So this is for airbag or the solenoid driver for pedestrian protections. Even the braking ICs also have a similar topology. Okay, right. So when the, the fundamental problem for fast switching is what we need to watch out when we are using a charge pump or a boost converter. So for example, here there is the battery pin and this battery pin is supplying a charge pump as well as an LDO. So what happens is when, let's say the switching of these transistors, right? You are pushing your bottom plate of the capacitor very fast, or if there is a over voltage on the output, then you turn off the charge pump very fast. Then there is amps of current going into the ground. So that is the DI by DT problem that comes in. So because of the bond wire, there is a lot of noise generated on the bond pad. So no matter how large capacitors you have on the pin, it, it's, it's not going to do you much in benefit. What happens is this bond pad starts to become more noisy because it has the boosting effect when you turn off the current very quickly. And as a result, this turns out to be high, uh, noisy, highly noisy bond pad for the LDO, and it comes out as a PSR problem for PMOS-based regulators. So when you have, we have to really address these kind of situations for which we have to have Either slow rate control, you know, in charge pump as well, or any switching circuit should have that. So you have to slow down your edges, or you have to minimize your bond wire. So there is additional innovation going on the packet side where, where they use clip chip or ball grid arrays, but still most of the automotive designs have bond wires in place. So they are thinking much about switching. This is an exception for DC-DC converters because they have to meet, you know, the efficiency has to be high for those. But in most of the gate drivers for automotive applications, the switching edges, you know, the, the DI by DT is in the order of 20, 10 to 20 nanoseconds. Nobody tries to switch below five nanoseconds because of these kind of problems. Okay, here is an example. So this one is really a very, very fast switching node in the charge pump. We can see that this generated bad noise on the battery bond pad. As a result of which you can see the noise getting reflected on the LDO output, despite having some capacitance. So you can see that there is a change in the voltage before it corrects itself. And these kind of things can be very um, hurt, you know, can be very dangerous to the applications, especially when they drive the sensors. So the recommended switching or the rise and fall time for these charge pumps or any switching circuit is in the order of 20 nanoseconds to 30 nanoseconds. You don't want to go below five or 10 nanoseconds. So when having you come with high frequency con converters, which are running at two megahertz or more, of course, this is going to still hurt and they have a different solution where they change the package and they have a little bit more slew rate control implemented these days. Okay, So this is a pretty important message for the designers to watch out for the emissions. The EMI is really a performance, something that can be a very critical uh, design parameter, you know, so there are some levels that we have to uh, adhere to in order to get the device working in the harsh environment in the automotive world. Okay, so with this, let me go and introduce you to some thermal simulations and why we need it. As I told you, the smart power drivers really need to provide an information about the load current. So you need to sense the current. And then, of course, these are very standard topologies where you sense the current and then take the output voltage through another resistor. So the output voltage informing you about the nature of the load uh, is available through this type of topologies, a high side or a low side based topology. And we also use a current sense based approach, which is the sense fed, and then you sense the current and regulate back 
uh, the gate voltage of this transistor. So this is to limit the current in case of faults. Okay. So whenever you do this in some automotive applications like airbag, so we are talking about like this is like a 120 milliohm resistor, and then you have to sense this voltage and then limit the current because in airbag it works as a current source. So it is basically dissipating about 68 watts of current, uh, watts of power for 0.75 milliseconds. These are very, very short transients, but still, if you look at the supply of 33 volt or 24 volt and above, we are already talking about 45 to 68 watts. Here, this is with 33 volts, so you get about 64. In some cases, this could be at 22 volts or 24 volts, but we still are talking about tens of watts of power that is getting dissipated across the FET. So this FET, this is like a one ohm load or two ohm load. So you will see that the FET is dissipating a lot of power. So now how to size this transistor? If you size this for 175 degrees junction temperature, which is what you do for DC conditions, the size is simply going to explode. And then you cannot integrate 16 or 20 drivers like that. This, the area of the chip, is, the cost is simply not affordable. So that is where we found out if that is a transient based power dissipation where the package is not getting involved because less than three micro milliseconds, the intervention of the package to power dissipation uh, to influence the dissipation of this transistor and the junction temperature rise is very, very less. So for that, what we decided is to see where the FET breaks and try to find the margin and see if we can push the junction temperature high. So that is how the flow term or the thermal simulation starts. So you size the FET typically for RDS on, and then you give the thermal worst case conditions like 68 watts of power for 0.75 milliseconds. And then each technology, the, the experts, the device experts come and tell you at what point your device breaks. So in the thermal simulation, you also choose your floor plan. So for example, this is a four channel airbag driver. So where you can see all the four power feds placed at the corner. So we, this is again set by the pinout, right? Pin FMA tells you where to keep the pins and based on the pins, you keep the power feds. That's how the location is fixed. And then you come back, measure, typically in your layout, go and measure these distances where we can place this and provide this kind of information to the thermal simulator like flow therm. These days there are other tools like Magwell and so on. So those kind of tools are telling you how much is the junction temperature rise at the center of the FET and also around the FET in, and then so that you can design the circuit for, uh, from a thermal robustness. And the point at which, uh, you know, you, the, the technology team gives you a number called the critical temperature. And this is the temperature above which the LDMOS FET or any other FET will get completely destroyed. It becomes just a wire, a shot between drain and source if you exceed the temperature. So we try to find a sweet point. You don't want to size it up to 175, but try to go a little bit more. And then see that if at that temperature, if you are still within your critical temperature, if you are okay, then you don't need to size up the FET further. But if it is coming out that you still need to, you know, that, that particular dimension is not sufficient, you go back and then, uh, you know, increase your W by L and then come back and redo the same. So if RDS on based area is 0.18, then thermal simulation tells you you have to use 0.2 square millimeter such that the temperature rise within the FET during these kind of operating conditions is less than your critical temperature. Then you go with 0.2 square millimeter, which, which means that if you choose 0.18, you're going to really destroy the FET. So you always go with the slightly larger FET. You don't need to uh, that means well, you're optimizing this 0.2 square millimeter for 400 degrees C junction temperature. If you do this optimization for 175, this won't be 0.2, but it will be, let's say, 0.6. And that's a large area. Really, we are wasting so much area for transient conditions. So that is one of the biggest trade-offs that we found out that we can do it. And then we are really, really we have proved that it's still reliable to use those kind of um, dimensions and push the temperature higher. Okay. So this is, for example, how the isothermal plot from the thermal simulator looks like. And this is basically telling you how hard the center of the FETs can go for transient conditions. Of course, this is also based on the assumption that you know you activate the pulse first, and then it takes about, for airbag and all, that the cooling time is longer because you don't know when to deploy the next airbag. We never know that. It's going to be at least 500 milliseconds 
you know, from a testing standpoint. So there is a lot of time for the Fed to cool down back to the ambient, you know. So, so in those conditions, you can simply size the Fed optimally and push the temperature for about 453 to 460 degrees. Again, this is based on the technology. Some other suppliers might have 500 degrees or 530 maybe, then you can push it a little bit more. In some cases, if the temperature is about 450, of course, you don't want to operate more than 400 degrees. So you need to have the margin between your junction temperature rise and the critical temperature for transient conditions. This way you can optimize the Fed much better and avoid a larger increase in dye area, okay? So after doing all this, I mean, we end up in basically, a, we come up with a topology, which is very straightforward, a folded cascode, a very simple compensation scheme, and then a source follower before driving it to the large power fence. Now, this is how the placement looks. So all the high temperature is contained within the FET. So about 430 to 460 is what we see. And of course, the reference current generator on the OTA, you know, you want to keep it at 200 degrees or 175 because we don't have spice models for more than 200 degrees. This, most of the suppliers don't have that. So you put your critical circuits at those particular junction temperatures. Now, okay, can we use a current source? Okay, there could be some conditions at power up where the current source may not be active. So you have, you're completely having a, there are chances that your VT can be, uh, your VGS can go higher than VT. So what we do in automotive design is all, most of the source followers are converted in from current sources to resistors. So the resistors are connected at the source of the source follower. We don't try to put current sources because that current could be undefined in some of the operating conditions. We will see that. So this is always called uh, the passive discharge. This, is, this resistor between the gate and source always keeps your VGS less than the VT when the FET is not turned on. But then you have some power supply ramp conditions. And uh, this is keeping that, the, making sure the FET is really turned on, uh, turned off in those cases. So a current source gets replaced by a, a resistor in automotive world. And this is what you will see in most of the uh, even discrete designs as well, where they put a resistor between the gate and the source to keep those VGS pretty less than the VT. And now with the clamps, you know, the source follower is placed in the area where your temperature rises about 250 degrees. I cannot simulate about 200. So at least I make sure that at 250 degrees, the source follower will not um, break, basically. That, that's the idea. So you do a cautious design a risk analysis and then decide on the topology. And again, in the thermal simulation at 300 degrees, you don't know whether there will be too much leakage on the source follow on the diodes. So these operating currents for the op amp is in the order of five micrograms or like two micrograms. So you don't want that output current to go into the diode. So what we also did is through our DFMEA, removed all the forward diodes. So you don't want these kind of risky leaky forward diodes, and then you can simply protect your gate to source junction with a single bag reverse zener. And then all you're doing is a trade-off between a nanoamps of leakage versus microamp of leakage, which is completely okay in this application. So this is how, you know, DFMEA comes in ha hand in hand with the, uh, with the uh, analog design, you know, in the automotive world. So you don't, you cannot simply skip DFMEA. It is every time a part of risk analysis and a risk mitigation for automotive designers. And right now coming to the freewheeling. So as I told you before, the inductors really, so you have a large inductive load here, so which can go anywhere between one micro Henry to three milli Henry. Now when the driver turns off, so that means when this control signal is turning off the OTA, since we cannot afford to put a synchronous pet or a short external short key diode, what we try to do is as this voltage goes negative, then we try to take advantage of this parasitic diode, the PN junction here, and then turn on the FET when the FET turns off. So meaning the driver is turning off, but your FET is still turning on to provide the freewheeling current. And this we have seen helps, uh, you know, much better, you know, and then it's much more robust in providing the freewheeling current. And we don't need to rely on any external short key diodes. And the voltage is completely limited to about minus two or minus three volt. And simply that uh, this solution has been more uh, uh, robust for these kind of 
um, freewheeling paths. So you don't need any external shortcut diode for this. Okay. The only thing you have to make sure is when this pin goes negative, the gate is going negative, and this should not go and turn off the control signal. So the output of the OTA has to go to zero. That means this pull down has to really work, and uh, the, nothing can steal the current from this inverter that is going and turning on this particular control control transistor. So in that aspect, so what typically happens is the gate of the transistor, the MX here, if the, one of the pins, if the, as this node goes negative, so what is very important is we have to watch out for these kind of parasitic bipolars that are present on chip. You, you don't have a tool to do that, but you have to do a layout review and then make sure that these, you have to, you have, you, we have to really visualize these NPNs in the design and then try to mitigate it. So here, if this NPN turns on, then pretty much this control signal, this transistor is not of any use anymore. It's not going to pull down the gate of the spec. So what we do uh, in those kind of cases, so pretty much we start to guard ring this particular transistor in order to make sure there is a sacrificial collector to provide this collector current into the, when the, the spin goes negative. And then it saves the uh, main transistor and ensures that the node of the output of this OTA is pulled to ground. So these days, I mean, guard rings are replaced with deep trench. So deep trench is also found effective to mitigate these kind of parasitic NPNs. Okay, right. So, so far what we have seen is a driver, it's supply and it's a multiple supply voltage domain. So where all the power rails are together, right? So all those have to be present control signal has to be active in order to make sure the drivers work. Now, the automotive circuits are something very unique, which is called the unpowered state requirement. Let me talk about that a little bit. So the moment you integrate multiple drivers, so I'm showing you, for example, an airbag application. So I have two drivers here. These two are completely independent because, I mean, other than the common drain voltage, the, the, it has its own output, it has its own control signal, and of course, the supplies are all common. That's fine. The gate driver has common supplies, right? But what can happen from a fault standpoint, this can be completely independent. So the output of this node can go to zero, can be shorted to ground, whereas the output of this particular pin, driver two, can be shorted to battery. Now, when you have a very fast transient, because those are inductance, there are a lot of inductance, and the, there can be spikes on those lines that can really have this node shorted to battery very quickly. When such fast transients happen, let's say we are even asked to design, I mean, typically it's 14 volt in 300 nanoseconds, but we have been asked to design those circuits to be uh, withstanding even 35 volt for 300 nanoseconds. When you have that fast transient in the unpowered state, which means your ECU is powered off, there is no boost converter output, there is no low voltage rail, there is no pull down on the gate. So when this, happens very quickly, the gate to drain capacitance is so big that it can couple the voltage and bring up, bring the gate up. So when this gate rises, then you have to, the current can go through this load and then deploy the airbag inadvertently. This is the problem in airbag designs. It's also for other applications as well, laser drivers or LEDs. You, you don't want to see the blinking of the LEDs inadvertently, for example. So these, these kind of things have to be addressed. The unpowered state requirement is getting really, really a lot of attention from our customers. They test specifically with these kind of spikes. This is why we have to be fault tolerant here. So this is also the cross link that I mentioned. A fault on one can affect the other. So this is again, you know, two independent drivers where they talk to each other through these kind of fault modes. So if we don't have enough circuitry here to discharge the gate, what is going to happen? Because nothing is going to pull down the gate, the voltage stays high. So when the voltage stays high, if it is an airbag, you're going to deploy it without even, that means even when there is no crash, a fault like this can simply deploy the airbag and injure the driver. And that is not allowed. So that is where there is a complete specification to allow this discharge very quickly. And that current is about four or five amp or four microsecond. So each application has its own specification and we need to tune the driver to handle these kind of requirements. Okay, so what we do for those, and this is where if it is a very, very slow shot, of course, the RGS can help, you know, so basically that's why I told you before, 
that we design source followers with resistors and uh, not current sources as per the textbook. Even though the textbook recommends current sources, we do it with resistors to keep this uh, FET intact from uh, making sure VGS is less than VT. And for the fast transients that happen in 30, like 300 nanoseconds, we have a feed forward coupling through a capacitor and then I have a pull down that goes and shunts this particular resistor in such a way that the discharge happens very quickly. And you can see that the current goes about to 1.7 amp for 300 nanoseconds and the volt gate voltage is discharged below its VT. So this is called the active discharge. So all automotive circuits specifically uh, need these kind of integration passive and active discharge to address some of the unpowered state requirements. Nothing else changed in the power state. In the power state, the circuit is the same. This should be disabled. But in the unpowered state, when these kind of faults happen, you know, this circuit reacts and then helps to pro protect the... It's, it's not a problem really for the Fed. It's mainly the load gets activated during these kind of fault conditions, which needs to be avoided. Okay. And here is now an example of the, the reg regulation of these resistors at high, of these uh, loops at high temperatures. You can see it's very, very stable. So even though we are not able to simulate it for more than 200 degrees, you can still guarantee a very, very robust circuit, a functional circuit that withstands several million pulses like this, uh, you know, based on your thermal simulations and design FMEA. All you do is analyze the risk, mitigate it, make sure it is robust. That's what we are trying to do. Okay, and the same concept can be applied for the low side driver in which we are using a sense fed based current sensing because this current limit is about three amps or more. So in that aspect, what we do is we sense the current through a sense fed. There is this VDS equalizer and another loop to regulate the current. We do the st standard procedure with the multiple loops, do multiple STB analysis for each loop, make sure that each loop is stable. And then again, the freewheeling is provided by these a uh, drain to, I think it's the next slide, there is a drain to gate clamp here. So for the freewheeling. So that means when this driver turns off, then this inductor, this is a boosting node. So this voltage goes up very high. And then you couple, there's a clamp that breaks and then pulls the gate high and discharges, turns on the FET to make sure that the voltage does not spike up too much. So the same what you applied on the high side by turning on the VGS, here you are trying to break the VGD clamp and then try pushing current into the transistor. Okay, so here is basically the topology. And because now the inductor is on the drain side, this is a, already a second order transfer function when you go from the gate to drain. So we use current based differential amplifiers in order to stabilize the loop. And you can also see that everything is simply a current mirror, a common gate based topology. So you get the source input, and then of course it's all cascoded current mirrors, and then the output from here drives it uh, to to limit the current. And when there is a very fast discharge happening on the drain, so you see that the protection diode can be used in your favor. So nothing else is available to pull down the gate of this transistor in the power unpowered state. So once a very fast uh, spike happens, the CGD will bring up the gate, and then you forward bias the diode, and then you you discharge it through the resistor. So again, here is basically a topology where instead of a current source, I mean, use a current source, and this point you are dropping it as a cross resistor. So we have to be very, very selective in deciding between a current source and a resistor because the resistors are really the, the, the best candidates to protect the designs in the unpowered state. And this is very important to know for, from, a, from a design perspective. And again, this is the this is this is becoming the passive discharge that I showed for the high side, and the active discharge is again implemented through the feed forward. So it's same same concept, and then you use feed forward, charge up this node, and turn on the pull down that's going to shunt this resistor for a quick discharge. You can clearly see that, you know, with the fast discharge it's very quick, and with the slow discharge it takes a little bit of time to go. Without I mean, this is without the free the the additional peak current limitation. So this is just the resistor is doing that, it's good, but we might exceed the five amp for four microseconds if you have a larger FET here. So in that situation, this active discharge helps to speed up the discharge, okay? And what kind of tests the customers do? So, you know, see automotive designs are all about 
making the part as robust as possible. They take it, do the regular functional tests, which is basically the current regulation here, but then they don't stop there. What they do, they try to expect every possible failure, and then they try to see where the FET or the, where the circuit can be destroyed. So for example, in the 20 years ago, they were not aware of a potential condition where this load can open and close. Because it's a pyro material, as current starts to go up, you know, so it can, the resistance start to increase. And if the connection is little bad, so it can completely open up and it can also chatter back again. So that means yeah, as the high side fed is regulating the current, you know, this load can change anywhere between one ohm from one ohm to 100 ohms. So 100 ohm means there's completely no current from the high side and suddenly it can come back to one ohm. So then we have to survive that. And they went again, try to push it back, to push a little bit more constraints on the device. Suddenly what they did, okay, I'm going to open this load. What happens if there's a shot to battery on this side? So when they do the shot to battery, you know, the low side regulator regulation loop will take over and limit the current to three amps. So you take a small window of two millisecond, go and keep chattering the load up and down every 500 microseconds. Even in those situations, we have to survive the peak currents have to be withstood by the device and so on. So you can see here from a very, very simple circuit, how the, complicated, uh, the, the, the things, the testing conditions go very complicated. And then you have to make sure during a simulation, you know, we, we address all those kind of faults. You know, you simulate, make sure that, you know, these control loops are working as expected and nothing really going wrong uh, during the design. And once you are satisfied that, okay, everything is working as expected, you do the PG and see if the silicon works that way. And here it's the same thing. So we did the design and then of course, uh, the, the results came out good. And here is also the peak current, the, you know, the unpowered state with very, very fast transients, how the low side and the uh, high side uh, limit the currents. So you have, you, you, have a, you have only one circuitry, but a lot of test conditions are imposed on that circuit to see whether you're surviving all those conditions. That's all about automotive design. One circuit, but multiple fault conditions that the device needs to withstand. Okay. So let's come to the very important topic on the level shifters. As I told you, the, uh, your voltage scheme, unless you control it, is not guaranteed. So that means my gate driver is it's a separate IC, and then the power supply can come from another IC supplier, and we don't know how the sequence is typically. So it can come in any form. So high voltage ramps first, most of the times, followed by medium voltage, then the low voltage. And we always use this kind of textbook circuits, you know, in order to level shift the signal. But in automotive applications, a lot of failures during testing are seen because the level, level shifters fail. Because when, when you have only the high voltage rail available or the medium voltage rail available, the, and the low voltage is not present, these nodes can go anywhere. It can be zero, it can be MV rail or MV by two and different devices will behave differently at different temperatures. Very, very hard to predict the trend, very, very hard to screen them out. So when this level shifter misbehaves, a V2I converter, for example, you know, these two transistors can also turn on and turn off the complete current mirror. The V2I converter can be completely turned off or completely turned on, both the currents can be turned on. So it can go in either direction and the same for the high voltage level shifter. And comparators can give you very, very false flags if there is no current in this comparator. So the one level shifter can create a big havoc across multiple circuits. And that is why we need to really correctly define the biasing of these level shifters. This becomes a very, very important topic in automotive design. So for example, why it is very important, let's say you have a low side driver and I'm shorting my this is my airbag load to battery. Suddenly, in what, during my power supply ramp, if this transistor gate voltage goes above VT, simply you are going to draw current and then you're deploying the airbag without any command. So there is no crash, but when I just turn on my system, all of a sudden my airbag is deployed. And this is not allowed. So this is a safety violation. And again, so that is why the biasing circuits have to be very, very, uh, robust in order to avoid these kind of uh, fault scenarios. Okay, 
So there are multiple patents, you know, that are listed, which generate a, a LB rail independent level shifters or LB rail independent bias converters. What we try to do here is simply use a common source level shifter. Again, a current a textbook circuit. But what we wanted to do is make sure that this bias current is available for this level shifter. So how do we do that? So based on the power supply, we generate, a, so we start from here. So no matter which supply, MB or also use a HP rail as well. That is, this is HV rail, that's a typo that I need to correct. So then we put a voltage selector that decides, provides some bias voltage to the circuitry. And then you have a current selector, which is again a maximum current selector. Because at startup, all you need is a 500 nanoamp to a microamp of current that you can generate from a very imprecise bias current generator. And then what you can do is once your analog cores come, come up, like the band gap comes up and the reference currents are out, then you provide another reference current. And this circuit is going to choose the maximum of these two currents. Because when the MV rail is off, this current is zero, only this current is present. So you all bias your level shifters at startup with 500 nanoamps or one microamp. But then as you go into normal mode, the junction temperature of the device will increase. So you want to bias these transistors with a much higher current to overcome the leakage. And in that aspect, you know, a current selector helps. And then basically you're simply biasing. The same topology can be used for the high voltage level shifter as well. You don't need to complicate your design. Again, play with the bias current and current, current common source stage. That's more than sufficient. Current mirrors, common source stage, eliminates basically all the potential failures related to floating nodes and then you make your power stage completely robust against these biasing conditions, okay? And this is how, so you take those control signals and add it in the corresponding nodes to make sure that your transistor is safe. It's off when it has to be off and it is on when it is to be off, okay? And this is a way to simulate. So basically also test it. So what we do, we ramp the high voltage, one of the ways, there are multiple ways to do it, but one of the ways is you go and ramp the high voltage supply then generate the medium voltage supply. Then this is the phase where your transistor has to be on. And the outside these, when there is no control signal, these have to be off. And we have guaranteed that by design as well. So this is one of the ways the customers also test it and make sure that the part is not responding to any of the missing supplies. That's very important. It, it has to work only when you have all the three supplies available. Outside this, the driver has to be off. No current through the power pit. So we have seen the power fets, their drivers, their supplies, and the biasing schemes. Now let me, the la, pretty much is the close to the end of the topic, so which is basically a diagnostic for these switches. Okay, let me go here. So what, what happens is all, there are a lot of inputs that we need to diagnose, uh, basically the resistance and the path between those high side and low side drivers the voltages of the supplies, you know, the boost converter, buck converter supplies all have to be diagnosed. So you have implement multiplexers and then basically provided to an analog output or an integrated ADC based on your uh, specification, you decide whether to integrate an ADC or you send this out to an ADC, which is in the micro and that can be measured as well. So only thing you have to make sure that these voltages are limited to 5.4, or these days it's 3.3 because the micros cannot handle more than 3.3 these days. So from a high side standpoint, it is the same circuitry, it's the same loop that we are using, but if you have the diagnostic currents need, should not be in the ampere range, it's unless, because you'll be draining the battery unnecessarily. So the diagnostic currents are typically in the range of 10 milliamps. So we have a 120 milliohm resistor, this is like a 1.2 millivolt drop. It's really, really a weak signal. So what we typically do is we operate this complete loop in open fashion. So, and you limit the voltage on the gate. All you need is to check if this voltage is able to get all the way up to three or four volts. So from typically it is at ground because when this pet is off and you turn on the current, you are able to pull it down towards 0.6 volt. It's limited by the diode. But then once you turn on this pet, it should go towards three volt or five volt. And this is what we need. And there is a comparator to say, oh yeah, this leak to high voltage or a medium voltage. We call it leak to battery or system level condition requirements. And in the low side, you do the complementary version. What you do, 
you basically inject current if it is not turned on the voltage will be high if it is turned on it is significantly close to ground and then you detect leak to ground we keep it very simple for diagnostics never mess it up because it needs to give you the correct information okay and coming to this multiplexers that i talked about we have to be very careful in a few switches here because what the customers typically do is during diagnostics they act you can activate only one switch because the multiplexer so one switch is active that goes to the analog output but they don't simply leave the neighboring pins just like that they try to take those whatever pins have to go negative they simply take it negative and see whether there is any disturbance again this is the cross link which is very important two pins are independent of each other they don't they have nothing to do but then once they come to the diagnostic module a disturbance on this this could be a high frequency noise coming in it could be a negative voltage it could be a esd what is very important is to make sure for example if you have bias current that has to go to the resistor it really has to go to this resistor but in the chip we have the parasitics as one of the pins goes negative if these two are placed in the vicinity it, it there will be an npn action that takes all the current into this source and they're leaving zero volts here so again we have to come back do a layout review place these accordingly and then avoid this npn transistor you cannot completely avoid it but i'll mitigate this npn risk with the trench or the sacrificial collector that we discussed before okay and coming to this reference resistance measurements you know so again what we do is always do a double take two current sources and do the differential measurements in order to calculate the resistance so when we do these kind of resistor measurements of course, of course you have to use two current sources two current sinks for example and the resistance always you know because all these pins in the squib or in the that are connected to the inductors can go negative what we typically do is bring the current limiting resistor before the switch so if you have a nmos switch here it is going to see a body diode from substrate to this drain and you don't want the current to flow out during those or you want to limit the current so very simple is always put the resistor first wherever there is a low current design you put the resistor first on a pin that goes negative so that is the message here so everywhere wherever wherever there is a pin that goes negative that goes to minus 3 volt put a resistor to limit the current out of the parasitic diode from the switches and this is one of the techniques which is now commonly employed by automotive designers in order to limit the current all it takes whenever you get into those fault conditions what we need to do is limit the current that's the mantra here so in the power fits you do it with a current limit circuit in the low current diagnostics there is no need to put a current limitation there uh, or a current sense and limiting circuit but you just throw the resistors appropriately to limit the current okay and these are examples for high voltage switches that they who they where the gate drive is adapted based on the voltage so if, if there's a 30 volt and if this supply is 35 volt you can set this to 33 volt if this supply if this pin goes to 5 volt this voltage gets automatically adapted to 8 volts it's like vt plus some ir drop so same for nmos so nmos back to back and pmos switches can be dynamically adapted the gate driver is basically dynamically adapted based on the input voltage okay and again let me talk a little bit about this um current regulation loop you know this all designs need a reference current reference voltage with the current limit this is nothing but an ldo only thing is the current limit is implemented with a separate loop on top you could also do it with the current mirror the main reason i showed this is to see the need for scalable designs as customers start to put the diagnostics always runs with multiple currents not by a single current source or a current sink because they want redundancy in the design to make sure that all is tested in the correct way they give you multiple currents so when they give you multiple currents and you have to design regulation loops for this then you always make sure that it is scalable meaning they have the same board i plot for all current levels so for example here let's say one current source Uh, in the one switch for the current number 1 and you activate another switch for current number 2 so basically these loops are 
driving power fits that are switchable. So there is a way the software tells you which current to use. So if it is S1, then this switch is closed. If it is S2, you cl close this switch. So all you are doing is putting staggered fits that are completely open and closed by switches. And same for the reference currents. So th this loop, so if the current source goes in RDS on mode in the normal operation, this voltage loop is going to regulate the voltage roughly to 4.8 volts. So what you do, you do a small signal analysis for both voltage settings. So you have reference voltage one, reference voltage two, and then you see that you come back and say that this for both current sources and current sink, the Bode plot is stable. You can mathematically show that you know you can that this is completely scalable. Why customers need it? Because you have two current sources at minimum. You have multiple load conditions, meaning at least the cap is going to change a lot. So this CL is going to vary from let's say 10 nanofarad to 100 nanofarad or 470 nanofarad. So in those situations, if you have if you count the number of simulations you will be running, it will go into thousands of simulations. So interpreting the result for each could become a headache. So what customers prefer is to make it more and more scalable. So if the Bode plot looks like this for one current, you try to mitigate, match the same in the design by using your scalability to get the same Bode plot for both the currents. And this can be done for n number of currents that you want. So this is for the top loop, which is the current loop. And you can see that is the same for both the current sources. So this is, you can mathematically also show the customer that you know your designs are very scalable. So this way they will not get worried about the stability when you suddenly change your current or suddenly change your cap. All you're giving is more a predictable behavior such that you know the diagnostics can be implemented in a very, very predictable way. That's the idea. So here is basically the silicon result for both uh, the settings. We have 36 milliamp and 4 milliamp. And you can clearly see that the settling behavior, of course, this is the turn off conditions so the load will determine this, but you can see that the stability is pretty similar for both uh, topo currents. Okay, with that, I will try to summarize. So the automotive designs are not different from conventional. So we use our design starts from this textbook. So you take the schematic from a previous IP or from the standard textbooks and start to think implementing about it. But then before you start, to implement completely, you have to consider the faults on the pins. And then the diagnostics, how we are going to diagnostics. These are the key for smart power ICs. And the designs are portable from one technology to the other. Make sure that from one BICOM node to another, that as you move in future, this is going to be completely portable, unless something else stops that you need a different topology. Now, after having said this, there are still some additional burden to the designers which is basically the fault conditions, the powered and unpowered state behavior, ESD. Of course, because the conventional, if you see that it's all one KV HPM, uh, you know, 500 volt CDM, you know, but here we could even go up to four KV HPM for some applications. And DPI is becoming a very important thing. So what they do here is to eliminate any particular radio, radio frequency interference to the main, to the main circuit. So that is done by high, injecting high frequency noise into some of the sensitive output pins, and then trying to see if there is any particular uh, failure that is seen, let's say between 100 megahertz uh, to one gigahertz. So for example, if your VCC output is five volt, and then I take the squib driver and one of the squib driver pins, I inject a high frequency noise, suddenly if the five volt starts to come down to four volt, then we don't pass the test. So it is a problem in the application and we need to go figure that out and fix the design. And that is important as well for uh, the RF immunity. So the level shifters, as I told you, have to be designed fail safe or fail silent. Uh, diagnostics and cross-link tests are really critical. And may, there are two things it has to do. It has to do the job, give the correct information, and also typically avoid the false information. False flag is really the worst alarm that a driver or a passenger can experience in the cars. So we don't want that to happen because of a failing comparator or a failing current mirror, whatever it is. So we have to design it carefully to those faults. And at the end, it all matters in automotive. What matters is the quality. You ship the parts to the field, to the car, you don't want a failure to come back to you. Of course, in the initial phase, there will be, you will take containment, 
but once you let's say one year after shipping the parts you know the goal is to have zero dbpm which is really really tough with this i thank you for your attention and i'm ready to take questions so uh, thank you so much uh, dr ishwaran it was a great talk um so the floor is open for questions does anyone has any questions we already did a bit late but only 5 10 minutes hello navin yes uh, so are the reliability factors such as cst or close key associated with in io cells of these depend upon this yeah uh, so could you please repeat the question it was not fully audible to me sorry yeah, can you please be loud yeah sorry i mean the uh, reliability factor such as est or closely associated with in io cells of these defined topologies yeah yeah it's yeah the reliability the main problem is coming from the all the high voltage circuitry esd because you know the clamping voltage can be way high and we have to make sure that uh those are still reliable you know so the esd means it takes it can take that voltage fetch can withstand it and then once the esd source is removed it still comes back to normal functionality so we don't face problems on the low voltage side at all it's always the challenge is in the high, high voltage side and as you mentioned it has to be subjected to multiple pulses and then we make sure that it's it's reliable so the post testing on the at should show that the parameters have not shifted that's the key point that's how the reliability is measured no destruction no short to grounds and then the parameter shift should be within the spec limits okay. so in terms of technology roadmap uh, if there is a change in technology so would there be a need of uh, you know a uh, revised version of the uh, defined topologies yes yes of course we have to yeah so first is you have to make sure that when you go to a new technology node that process is qualified first of all to start a project and then we do test chips uh, make sure the circuits are portable and they work in the same way you have to test it and then then you again go to the next step of exposing those circuits to faults and that's how the the device is proven reliable and it is ready for the mass market in the new technology was well, est is closely you know in line with the the process technology and reliability factor so yeah yeah okay Uh, any more questions i think there is one question in the chat uh, but i believe the person who wrote it left me yes. is the power management asic updated from the system user developer and also is uh, moti burkan he also asked me your email address so i'm thinking that he may reach out to you as well yeah sure um uh, it's fine yeah yeah you can talk to him sir okay we can so i also have a question for you is like uh, when you discuss about this temperature is 200 degrees celsius and all, how do you generate current reference circuits i mean are they stable enough like and then you you talk about current mirroring right? yeah i mean so we try to keep the topology very simple you know cast codes so those kind of current mirrors the main thing is to make sure that there is no big leakage through those due to impact and especially when you take it to high voltages we want to make sure so for example if i go back to the circuit So I remember you showed a band gap, right? Now, usually, yeah. like whatever circuits I've done, I've never <laughs> gone the band gap to like two hundred Celsius. No, no, no. Oh. So we we make sure that the band gaps are not placed in those areas. Okay. So at least one seventy five, we make sure that we talk to our technology team to make sure that you know those we can simulate and get reliable data at one seventy five for band gaps and so on. But sure. the current sure. mirrors, yes. we also keep it around one seventy five to two hundred. Okay. And yeah, right. And those will be. trimmable current mirrors we don't want to have untrimmed circuits okay so especially when the precision is very critical so right. we make sure that if we put very simple current mirrors that mm -hmm. have high gain high output impedance like okay. simple cast codes or folded cast code mirrors and then we make sure that at 200 degrees we still the error is pretty low so that's what we make sure and on the choice of the folded cast code did you is that the you know like uh, again it it is interesting because it it has zone advantages but when at the right high temperature it seems just does it seem because you need so much high gain and obviously you don't have any problems with the headroom right 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 there's uh, no problem with the headroom the only no, reason I, hmm, go ahead sorry. okay so let me see the only reason to use uh, this is basically i mean the lowest voltage was about 16 volt 
you know, so that where the supply could droop and we still need to work. But uh, yeah, th this could have been a different topology as well. So we started with this. And then uh, the main thing was to see how much leakage we have. So that was the only thing that we had to worry about so, from the output node. Exactly. So, so you yeah, want that was the only thing. So you want to control the impedance at that voltage at that uh, folded cascode, right? Right. And we don't want anything to go into the diode or whatever. Correct. And my understanding is the higher the impedance that over there, is that better for you? Is is that at that node? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, we, we, because there is another disadvantage because this is a 120 milliohm resistor and uh, you see that the GM times R, so there's not much gain we are making in this stage. It's even attenuating us. That is where I need to put all the gain here in order to uh, make up for the error, right? So the, whatever attenuation this is offering, so I need 60 dB gain, I need to put at least 90 dB, 100 dB here so that this attenuation can be compensated for it. And that is why we ended up in this topology with a very high output impedance. And we were still able to fight the leakage and we didn't have issues at all there. So, I mean, small offsets are okay that can be created in the loop, but, but you know, you don't want a five microampere current to get completely down to two microamp. And then it starts to give you a much, much lower output current. So there we were able to fight it with this kind of topology. And then also by spacing, keeping this at a temperature, which is, roughly around less than 200 degrees. So that was very the TT. So for example, if I would have placed it in a much, much closer area like this. Yeah, so this is where it is. So if you are seeing the slide here, so yes. the OTA and the reference generator are somewhere about 200 and 170 degrees. So for example, if I would have moved the OTA somewhere close to the 300 range, I don't know what kind of problems I would have faced. Yeah. I, I didn't experiment it because it's a product. So we have to also minimize the risk. So first thing is we kept it here. We put the source follower or any other diagnostic circuitry that is off during this particular deployment function. So those are placed in this area. So that is the way we mitigated the risk and it worked. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any more questions? Yes, um, I have the same, uh, I guess a question along on this slide here. So I guess, is there a challenge? Because the fact is you have different temperatures across the die from different circuitry. Um, are you shipping biases from one side to the other? And the fact that one area is a different temperature versus the other, can that cause temperature drifts or offsets that might create a risk? In circuit operation, I don't know if that's so really for this driver it. itself. There is no shift, but when we look into the thermal simulations, you know, so the overall see see all the analog cores will be sitting here, so the, all the band gaps and everything is here, and there is enough separation to avoid or uh, to reduce the thermal crosstalk during these kind of events. And what we have seen is these are very very short transients, like three milliseconds. There is not much drift happening. Thermal drift is all constrained within this particular FET, and we are not seeing drifts to this region. So you can see here, the thermal simulations indicate this particular region uh, is going to stay at the ambient. So, so if I go, let's say to this slide, let's see if I... So you see here, so this is where the core is and the FET is here. So you mm -hmm. can see there's a lot of, so, so the, the, the heat is not really coming out of this bed. So everything is contained within this bed, a little bit on the low side and a few hundreds of micrometers here. So this distance itself, we are talking about 200 micrometers and the distance from here to here is about one millimeter. So, so th this distance within the chip is good enough to mitigate any drift that's happening. So that's what we saw. So for the, in this three millisecond time frame, the drift is not much. All, mm -hmm. all the drips go around the FET and within the source follower area. And that is where we have to be very careful. All right. And is there, uh, I don't know much about the products here, but are there heat sinks deployed to take away heat from certain portions? Or Correct. is that not right. really? So, yes, so we do have a thermal pad, but again, for the small short transients, it doesn't make a significant difference. So we do have devices like this, where there is a thermal pad which has to be soldered, which we recommend to be soldered to ground on the PCB to take some of the heat. Of course, if you operate it, these kind of things about three milliseconds, then of course you will see the impact of the thermal pad 
and that will once when you solder it to solder it to ground i mean it's going to take some of the heat away no. so, my understanding is you, you don't see hysteresis or something like that because of all the huge temperature effects because of short transient is that okay and okay i think if, if uh, there was a more question but if anyone has more question otherwise i think it's also getting late for him he's two hours ahead of us um, yeah i just have one final question um, okay on your thermal modeling, uh, what was the flow tool that you used? So we used a flow therm tool where our, there is a special team in TI where they model this based on the floor plan and then they give us the numbers as in the Excel sheet. So they give us these kind of plots. So the tool that was used for this design was flow therm. And is this, is this integrated with Cadence or is this something like- No, it's something, it's, this, this was not integrated with Cadence, even though there are tools now getting integrated with Cadence, but yeah, this one was outside the Cadence environment. So this is the whole circuit biased and everything or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. we have to give you, give the complete information of what kind of circuits are running here. So that is why if you see here, right, this device, the ambient temperature in the application is about 105, 95 yes. to 105. But because some of the diagnostics might be running even before we turn on the power fetch, so we assumed our ambient junk temperature might have shifted by 40 degrees up. Okay. So that is where in the thermal sims we start with 135 and go from there. So so there are circuits running. That's what we assume. So you, and then you, once uh, you yeah you calculate the further temperature rise from there. Sure. Okay. Uh, one more question I have is the LDU that you showed, right? I mean, it's a simple LDO with the op amp, that one. So, you know, uh, the LDO performance all, a lot depends on what you're loading, right? Right, right, yeah. And uh, you have a lot of things loading there, which is, which is so much different than, so I think it was one of the first few slides. Yeah, here, this one, right? Or... Yes, so uh, could you talk a bit more about on the, you know, like do you see a, a huge changes in the loading and how do you kind of, you know, the current just changes a lot through this or like, how does it? Yeah, I mean, the current drift itself, I mean, the, the loading that we typically do in these kind of LDOs is in the range of 100 milliamps or 125 milliamps. Okay. Very rarely we do 375 or 500, very rare, that's very rare. Because it's an LDO and the battery can go up to 28 volts, we have the maximum current with lower drop voltage up to 125 milliamp. And the moment we go about 170 or something, then we have overcurrent detection that typically senses the current and turns off the LDO. So that's typically how we do it for these kind of applications. So the drift, everything is also not much. So we have to also make sure that, you know, the, the thermal shutdown for these kind of LDOs, you have a dedicated thermal shutdown is in the range of uh, 150 or 170 degrees. That's, that's how the typical implementation is. So that we don't want that to get so hot and destroy the package. Great. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, With I'm guessing now, <laughs> I think it's time for. Uh, so thank you again so much for your talk. It was a great talk. I think we learned a few things, uh, if not like everything from this automotive talk. It is very interesting. Thanks, Amit. Thanks for hosting me. Yes, yeah, sure. So thank you again, Dr. Ishwaran, and uh, hopefully we can have one talk where you can come over to Santa uh, Clara area, Bay area, and then we can have in-person talk as well. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Amit. Looking forward. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, then. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.